today the, the possibility to have the second part of our artificial intelligence and governance uh, webinars episodes. Uh, the title is the future of RE, AI regulation, global competition, economy, societies and ethics. And our host today is Axel Voss, member of the European Parliament, rapporteur on a civil liability regime for artificial intelligence and senator of SME Europe. And I will, I will give directly the floor to him because I think we have a lot to discuss and I want to be very efficient today, please. <laughs> Thanks, Horst. Um, so I would like to welcome you all. So the panelists and also, um, especially also the attendancy. Sees, um, so AI is of strategic relevance and therefore um, it's a good idea and thank you to the organizers also to uh, have these uh, kind of uh, hearing and, and uh, event. So um, what we are doing in the parliament is um, built on two pillars. The one is that we have a special committee on AIDA um, where I am the rapporteur for it. And uh, secondly, we have now the legislative proposal by the commission where we are as always in these digital files, files fighting because of the competences of the committees. And um, so what I still think the intention of this proposal is more to get a general frame so that I would say there's no specifications for the digital single market, no speci specifications for the industry. It's a general approach on AI and therefore um, I'm totally not satisfied with the decision so far what is taken by the referral unit of the parliament and um, for the competences of AI. But um, we have to have in mind AI is a very big step forward to our future. We have to have in mind that there are some preconditions what we have to work on like infrastructure, data, investment, etc. And um, here, therefore, I'm very much welcome also my former colleague Michal Boni, and he's presenting also today um, kind of an uh, evaluation and, and uh, situation and gives us some ideas, but thanks once again also to all other panelists and, and you might think AI is more a female topic and then if you're thinking this you are right, um, as you can see on our panel and uh, so um, let's do here something what that we are not avoiding AI systems in the future, even if this is high risk. So we have to find a good approach to it, a balanced approach to it, and let's focus on these high risk AI systems um, in the regulation. So um, I hope then we might have a good start also in Europe with the AI developments. So all the best for you and thanks for having you also here on our event. Thank you very much, Axel, for this introduction to a very complicated topic also. I think there we have a lot to discuss and also uh, because so many uh, aspects of our society's economy are touched and I think this is the starting point for a discussion and uh, we will have also a lot of try and errors also here. But I think for this, we have also uh, studies like artificial intelligence and governance going behind ethics by Michael Bonis to analyze it and to find ways how to make a good regulation who, who we can trust in AI, but also can use the chances. Please, Michael Boni, the first minister of digital affairs in uh, Central East Europe from 2011, 14, member of the European Parliament, former member of the European Parliament and Senator of SME Europe. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Horst, and uh, thank you very much, Axel. Uh, you have said that uh, AI uh, has uh, some kind of strategic relevance. I think it's, it's very, very important to understand it because it's crucial and it's our European challenge. I want to emphasize the need 
to understand and uh, develop uh, the complexity of AI ecosystem, which is crucial to build uh, the EU competitive advantages. You can see uh, the graph because I don't want to present uh, many slides. This is only one graph, the next piece. Okay, uh, you can see the graph, uh, which is related to my report done for the Martin Center on artificial intelligence and governance going beyond ethics. And uh, some points important for the uh, draft regulation presented in April by the European Commission. What is needed for the AI ecosystem development? holistic view on many dimensions of AI functioning and growth, understanding all interconnections and interdependencies visible between many aspects, as you can see on the graph uh, of uh, uh, AI development, as for example, risk-based approach, meeting principle-based approach, or as uh, for instance, between regulations broader than on AI related to machinery directive, product liability, etc., and practical implementation and uh, 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 democratic oversight. And the third need, uh, focus on harmonization. The way to establish global standards based on those worked out in the EU and make European AI solutions, the global reference point is harmonization, full EU harmonization as a first step to make it global. Uh, it's the way to avoid uh, fragmentation at this area. One of the very often discussed key topic is related to the trustworthiness uh, of AI solutions. In this context, we have to ask what are the trust builders for AI development? In my view, there are sensible trust builders. Firstly, human-centric, human-based approach, which requires to base AI systems on principles related to the fundamental rights and ethical approach, non-discriminatory models of algorithmic sequences, avoidance of hidden biases, and more transparent patterns for automated decision-making processes. Secondly, solving the problem of the deficit of transparent information, how AI works, which requires instruments allowing to avoid asymmetry of information between users, business type and individual type, and AI providers. Tools for making explainability practically workable. So it should be addressed to the different kinds of participants with various levels of needed information addressed to the users, to the insurance investigators in the case of incidents, uh, to the certification authorities as a part of confirmation assessment, to the scientists, it is crucial to give them access to the knowledge how AI works and what are the key drivers of many functionalities as we want to have scientists as supporters and participants of constant AI development in the European Union. Thirdly, uh, guarantees of the accessibility and quality of data necessary for AI feeding processes. It is important for data control-based approach, as you can see, needed for users with architecture, how to uh, control the own data. Also for building the data sharing models under clear conditions and for making risk-based approach much more implementable. It should be done in the light of data spaces development in the European Union. Fourthly, risk-based approach, as you can see, is the core of the uh, European view on the AI development with the pyramid of risks establishment. In addition, I want to ask how to evaluate the adequacy 
of this model vis-a-vis -vis the list of sectors and concrete cases taken into account. Also important, the tools for risk management described in the draft regulation, the focus on high risk systems as Axel expressed, uh, only 10 to 15% of uh, all uh, AI uh, based solutions in the European Union are high risk. It is key for some areas, for example, healthcare systems. And fifthly, uh, there are challenges of using risk-based approach proposed by the European Commission, especially when we want to encourage SMEs and startups to create and develop artificial intelligence. Whether all kinds of companies, uh, AI developers, can be ready to fulfill all requirements for the potentially high risk products, services uh, to be approved in the conformity assessment. How to use the relatively new instrument as ex ante assessment is, how to be prepared for ethical technology assessment model. If the procedures of human rights impact assessment, for example, are fully applicable. Sixthly, how to keep regulatory requirements as responsive for being future-proof. Future-proof is one of the key issues. It is crucial to balance regulatory framework and innovation needs if European AI solutions would like to be competitive globally. But will the national terms for regulatory sandboxes be the only more open way for unlimited innovation? Seventhly, how to ensure security for all AI products. So how to join the AI agenda with European Union cybersecurity certifications agenda. It should be connected, it's clear. Eighthly, building the trust uh, as you see, the trustworthy AI challenge is crucial. How to disseminate and promote in the business environment the significance of voluntary measures, for example, in the code of conduct format, allowing to take responsibility for making consumers fully informed about the AI functionalities and rules. And ninthly, Ethical and principle-based approach of AI development indicates the significance of the fundamental rights. But what is important for the sustainable AI growth is also related to the joint perspective. Fundamental rights should be joined with consumers' rights, with all possibilities for consumers to be protected and having the clear model of redress mechanisms. In conclusion, AI development is not only regulation and set of needed norms and standards with the possibility to be global. It is well done implementation. So two questions are essential. How the EU database high risk uh, AI systems should function, capacity, rules, effectiveness, and how the EU AI board should function. Currently, there is a significant deficit in the proposed composition of this body. The lack of business representatives, the lack of civic and consumers organizations, the lack of science uh, representatives. The broader composition should be crucial uh, to make this board more oriented for the future solutions and innovation and playing the role of oversight institution. Why I am asking about the institutional capacity for AI development and regulation implementation, because AI ecosystem, the whole ecosystem, requires governance by law and collaborative oversight. And finally, three remarks which are fundamental in my opinion. One, developing trustworthy AI, we have to guarantee the legal certainty for business it is obvious. Also, the legal certainty and the legislation understandability for users, for consumers, 
So digital AI literacy is needed. Two, developing AI, not only for the current needs, but also for the unknown future needs. We have to review and check if the AI definition used in the draft proposal is the most adequate to be future proof. Three, thinking about making European model of AI development as a global reference point, we have to, on the one side, keep our European values, on the other, be open for compromises with the world's leaders at the AI environment. I am not thinking about uh, China. It uh, should be done, especially with transatlantic partners. This is the best way to accelerate AI development based on trust builders and based on keeping uh, innovating business and transatlantic orientations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. I think you gave us really a complex uh, and uh, very good overview, very structured. And I, I think there's a lot, you, you raise also questions and, and, and remarks here. And I think this will be very interesting for our debate. Only a, a general question, because you, we have to think, you know, business and you know, politics, you know, as, as lawmaker and, and also executive. Uh, how we can be so fast as, as, as uh, legislator to adapt so much uh, to something what is so un flexible and, and somehow also unknown? Is this really the instrument normally we take two, four years to, to adapt something to develop? How we can we can adjust this? Do we have also to rethink our structures to, to be fit as regulators for the future? Thank you very much, Horst. Uh, uh, Axel mentioned uh, in, the, in uh, his introductory remarks how important is the work in the European Parliament. And it is very important that in the Parliament we have this special committee focused on artificial intelligence. So my view is that, uh, it's my personal view, uh, that if you want to achieve a, a holistic view and uh, prepare the agenda and some kind of roadmap, we need to start with uh, 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 the best agenda for this uh, committee. And all committees, ITRE, IMCO, and so on and so on, uh, Yuri should be under the, uh, uh, I don't want to say governance, but uh, under the view of this special committee. Because this is the only way to avoid uh, uh, structured uh, conflicts between uh, many different areas and focus on artificial intelligence, holistic development. This is firstly uh, one. Secondly, we need to work with member states because I'm afraid that uh, there are many pressures from me member states uh, to avoid some, uh, some aspects of harmonization which is needed. Uh, and uh, thirdly, we need to start discussions with, uh, uh, on the transatlantic level with our partners uh, because if we want to avoid the conflict and contradiction between what European Parliament and European institution, uh, institutions will achieve and what is, uh, will be developed in the United States and Canada, Japan, South Korea, so we need to start the operation at the early stage. Uh, if we want to achieve and build our co future competitive advantages, so good agenda, uh, 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 strong uh, cooperation uh, under the uh, view done by the special committee, uh, uh, harmonization and uh, strong work with member states, and of course, at the same time, work with our partners uh, uh, all over the world without China, in my view. Thank you very much. And now we're coming to the debate. This is a f reflection what we heard from Michael and Axel and also perhaps new perspectives uh, to the discussion. And we're starting with Elin Chivot, Senior Advisor on Digital Policy of the EPP. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Horst, and, and, and thank you to SME Europe and MEP Axel Voss for his uh, invitation and, and energy and work on the future of our digital economy. 
So it's great to work with you and, and with Michelle Gunyu as well. It's great to be part of this um, conversation today. Michelle, you've said a lot of the right things, uh, but uh, I'll try to comment still on, uh, on, on you know, where, what, I, what I think is worth mentioning when it comes to the EU uh, AI Act. Um, well, starting from the premise that we cannot afford not to seize the opportunities digital technologies like AI will offer, that if we do not, you know, our competitors will. Uh, and with the AI Act, I think we have a good starting point to, to have this overall advanced strategy that can um, foster the development and the uptake of AI in Europe and address at the same time the, the societal challenges that arise with the technology. Now, it's important to recognize that new technologies like AI must still improve and they can also have the stabilizing effects on our society and our economy, depending on when they're, how they're used. And there are risks and concerns, such as the loss of jobs through automation and or production of negative discriminations that we must address, but also keeping in mind that progress um, with that technology and allowing it to flourish is what will also help address this problem. So we need clear rules that protect people, but also we need to make sure we enable that progress. There was, I think, initially a positive reaction from, from a lot of different stakeholders um, on, about the AI Act. So I think that suggests there is acceptance that we need some level of regulation and that it can be a positive thing. Uh, I think that was discussed is indeed like, you know, it, it, it's not like a traditional standard setting. So future AI uh, regulation will require expertise, uh, cooperation between public and private sector and enforcement instruments and, and mechanisms that are flexible to address, like was mentioned, the um, evolving nature of algorithms and ensure you, you can still have adequate, appropriate and uh, continuous regulatory revisions. Uh, so I think the act is the first in terms of trying to, uh, to establish those rules. Of course, they will require clarification. Uh, and that's why the discussions in parliament indeed are super uh, important and hopefully we'll have uh, a, you know, agreement among committees very soon. So some points for improvements. Um, I mean, again, we've heard a lot from, from Michelle's presentation, which was great. Um, I think the lack of clarity and legal certainty around the definition of things like also subliminal techniques, uh, that there needs to be more clarification around that. Uh, we also have to make sure, you know, we have existing laws and regulations and, uh, and upcoming legislative proposals that they may affect the AI Act and vice versa. So we also have to anticipate the uh, indirect and, and um, cumulative effects of all regulations to avoid that um, we're just adding more burdens and costs for the development of AI in the EU, especially for SMEs. Uh, and of course, that was mentioned, there are calls to further clarify the definitions of low versus high risk. And why is that important to establish um, that definition is because uh, the AI regulation doesn't exist in isolation. Many existing legislations will fit into this law. Uh, Various sectors are already subject to, you know, strong uh, protections and legislation. So, those identified as high risk uh, would have to be subject to additional requirements potentially, which is not uh, nothing from a business and adaptation point of view. Um, one thing I, I was recently also discussed this week, um, you know, there are genuine concerns raised by some uh, stakeholders as as far as the the impact of AI on on competitiveness of our company. Of course, uh, the, the act will uh, mean uh, adjustment for, for businesses, um, but that's why we should ensure enough guidance to avoid impractical and redundant requirements. Uh, and the, of course, uh, there will mean more uh, internal and external quality controls, uh, but it's good to see that there is a degree of self-regulation uh, through self-assessment. Another thing that is very much discussed is how other stakeholders are calling for the ban uh, of some technologies like AI. Um, you know, and, and you know, I think we've even heard the European Data Protection Supervisors and the board, uh, um, but they find it problematic that apart from social core scoring, um, not all, um, you know, all the prohibited uses like biometric surveillance are allowed for, for law enforcement uh, purposes. Now, I think it's important to mention that we must accept that regulating or banning technologies will not solve all issues. And we have to focus on the other issues that affect, um, you know, that address the, the challenges of AI, like education and skills. And we should still develop technologies using protected environments like sandboxes, because otherwise what will happen 
is that we will be ceding the market and those technologies to others, to our competitors like China, who tend to build AI systems that reflect the tenets of their regime and value systems. And I haven't heard many Europeans say that they agree with it. And um, now to, to uh, end up on the number of enabling conditions that I believe um, would be helpful for the EU to make sure its plan works uh, is that we have, you know, streamlined common market, uh, better access to funding, fewer impractical regulations. Things like access to visas for highly skilled individuals can also help. Uh, also, legal consistency has to be ensured across the board. Uh, we have to make sure our frameworks don't impede our ability to use data that feed into those AI systems because those systems can help save lives, I've seen during the pandemic. Uh, there's repeating again that we need a, a common uh, um, markets, capital, uh, uh, capital markets. Uh, you know, we have digital inequalities across regions. We need to incentivize private investments in VC capital funding. Um, there's, I mean, there's plenty of things like that. I could, I could go on better connectivity. Uh, also invest not just in everything, but where we can make a difference. Uh, and ensure also no disruptions to uh, the flow of data uh, you know, within the EU and beyond so that we can ensure we have access to high quality data sets, robust data sets, which AI and the AI Act demands. Uh, so, you know, and that all again requires more computer capabilities like semiconductors that can enable algorithms to store, run and test data. That is also part of EU plans with the digital decade objectives. So, everything is sort of connected. Um, and I think one point that was mentioned that I really like to say, it's not very popular because it's a long-term thing. We have to involve the public to socialize them to the risks and opportunities of AI. Different categories of people have different levels of trust, different um, access to recourse. And their support is actually going to be a really big part of how we get to use uh, AI responsibly with everyone's vigilance and awareness, uh, for instance, with human machine teaming and work environment. So their general AI competence is really important. We'll get back to the, the fact that we also have a technology adoption problem on the side of companies that has to be solved. Uh, and just to close, I think um, what I also hear fortunately is that we need some more clarity in the face of those many, many multilateral um, tech alliances, AI alliances, they exist. They don't always include all member states. So if we want to give more thrust to our joint EU approach, we need to make sure uh, more member states are represented. Uh, and finally, as Michelle also rightly mentioned, we need to keep in mind our partnership with our allies because they also have strength and we have to figure out how we can optimize our, our competitive advantages together. Um, so um, I leave it to that and I'm looking forward to hearing what my co-panelists will have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for this perspective and comment. I would like to ask you only last week was yeah, also US Trade uh, and, and Tech Council was set up. And uh, there's also the, 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 the idea behind to work together towards uh, this uh, transatlantic AI agreement. But where are the limits in fact? Because there's different approach, different, uh, different philosophies. If Europe sets standards and America sets standards, where will be then the compromise or where are the limits of such compromises or we will have in the end two different definitions and systems if you don't uh, be flexible enough what is yeah. um thank you for your question i think we maybe have two but we'll have maybe more approaches so uh, more fragmentation uh yeah you know i think the americans put their priorities differently they, they they're very much focusing on, on china and they're afraid of being outperformed in terms of investment even though they are still ahead and what they're really pushing is for us, Europe, to also focus on that competition against China. Um, so they're also, of course, worried about democratic values and working together to find a common approach to regulation. And I think there was a lot of positive attitudes around the, the Tech and Trade Council last week. But I don't think the EU, we can expect the US to adopt uh, formally the, this definition of high risk or not even it's the precise system of conformity assessments for that matter, uh, or the approach of, of comprehensive regulation. Uh, and I think Europe's lead hasn't gone down very well in US circles. You know, a lot of officials uh, 
you know, they remain, they're worried that this regulating first attitude of Europe uh, might um, uh, come in a way of multinational coordination, especially via the OECD. And even the, um, uh, someone from the National Security Commission on AI even called the AI Act a disaster, uh, that we're not doing enough to counter the Chinese threat, et cetera, et cetera. And there's growing concern as well on the American side that Europe has this impression that the Biden administration wants to you know, kind of copy the EU's approach because, for instance, they're going ahead with a strong uh, competition agenda vis-a-vis -vis big tech. But that doesn't mean that the US will accept um, similar European regulation that affect Europe, American companies if they don't affect European ones. I think there will be focus on the TTC on market access um, rather than really reaching regulatory convergence. Uh, there are still too many different approaches but you can, you can see there can be good productive work um, at different levels. Uh, for instance, on transparency obligations for AI in some cases that could work for the US. Uh, but if it's a type of transparency that's meaningful and that's useful to people, which is not always obvious. Um, yeah, and I mean, I could go on, but uh, I think I will leave it to that. And uh, yeah, because I, I see the potential. Uh, but I think we shouldn't underestimate the fact that we have many unresolved issues uh, in the digital area. Thank you very much for, for this answer. Now we're coming to Dr. Olivia, Olivia Erdely, School of Law, University of Canterbury, Director of Ethics and Policy, Soul Machines, member of the OECD Network of Experts on AI, member of the Future of Work, Working Group of the Global Partnership on AI. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Horst. So after all we've heard, I would like to concentrate on two aspects. One would be the relationship between regulation and competitiveness. So traditionally, we assume an inverse relationship between these two, meaning that we think that regulation, the presence of regulation constrains competitiveness. But I would like to raise a thought. What if this does not hold for AI? And it's just a what if, but let's explore. So generally speaking, Adequate regulation leads to socially optimal outcomes in whatever area we are regulating. That is also, or should be also true for AI. And because of these positive outcomes, um, good regulation facilitates trust. This is, trust is the very thing that then facilitates social adoption of any emerging technologies, for instance. And this is the precondition for the existence of markets in these technologies in the first place. On the other hand, lack of trust seriously hampers and in certain cases may even annihilate markets. This is especially dangerous for emerging markets. Take, uh, take the examples of aviation safety, for instance. Um, we are not having trouble of getting on an airplane, at least most of us, because we know that there are severe regulation around or regulations in place around safety of um, aviation aircrafts and everything and so that planes are not going to fall from the sky but were this different we would not dare to go on an airplane another sector that illustrates the importance of trust in the regulatory framework is the financial system so think back of crisis and how the trust of the international community oscillates uh, around the quality and um, the ability of the regulatory framework to actually keep the system safe now, this trust dimension is the thing that I would like to concentrate here because I think that trust may be even more important for artificial intelligence technologies than for any other domain. Well, because of two things. The first thing is that the stakes are very, very high, perhaps higher than in any other domain. Although I might recall that aviation safety concerns our lives, so there are not many more important things than that. But still, with AI, um, our most fundamental rights and freedoms could be jeopardized on a systemic scale. And that is something that worries many stakeholders and people. The other thing that compounds these problems is uncertainty because we, the, both the nature and the magnitude of any potential social impacts uh, that stem from AI are not really fully understood at this juncture. So we have this uncertainty of, um, yeah, around how AI will impact us. And due to these things, I have the perception that user preferences are perhaps shifting to AI systems that do comply with the highest regulatory standards. So 
it is customers that come to companies with questions like, all right, do you have a system that actually complies with uh, minimal, minimum transparency requirements or with um, the GDPR privacy requirements, even though, and, and these may be customers and companies that are not even situated in the EU or, or trading directly with the EU, um, such as the importance of the GDPR, for instance. And so if users, uh, users prefer AI systems that are safe by some metric and that comply with the highest regulatory standards that are in place, then maybe stricter regulation um, mean more competitiveness rather than less competitiveness. It's just an interesting thing that I think we may want to explore. And so instead of being afraid that we have a new regulatory proposal that has some onerous requirements, because I admit they are onerous already, and uh, the more they are going to be clarified, the more onerous they will become probably. But still, um, if that is what users wish the AI systems to comply with, then we may see a competitive advantage in complying with these requirements and in having such regulation in place in the European Union. Um, a second point that I want to uh, talk about is um, that so far we have concentrated on the quality of the regulatory framework around AI systems. And what if the regulatory quality itself is not our key problem. So one other problem that I see with respect to the EU is a consistent lack of consensus among member states. So I believe that member states are not working together enough. And I also believe that we must get over our national differences and stand as a unit if we want to achieve good regulation or anything for that matter. Another thing that is a more pervasive problem and goes well beyond the European Union are relatively low moral standards and a general lack of respect for the rule of law. So the starting point here is that even the best regulatory framework cannot regulate everything. Therefore, much depends on the ethical judgment of both individuals, corporations, and even governments. And if we are looking into news headlines, one scandal follows the other, so we have a problem there. And the last point I want to raise is that the public's key concerns are usually centered around power concentration with or abuse, by, abuse of power by uh, big tech companies, which is, yes, one of uh, the perils that we are facing with AI innovation. But fewer people ask about governments. So I'm asking, what about abuse of power by governments? Think of routine strategic misinformation that we have experienced by on the part of governments to foster usually short-term political objectives. Think also of how, amplify, uh, how AI technologies may amplify these problems. So then maybe it is time to do something about that. And I would just leave that to the floor and uh, thank you for your attention. And I think we can debate some of the questions that every one of us has uh, raised so far. Thank you very much for this interesting perspective at the end, especially that we have also to think about our governments if you're discussing this not only to regulate big techs. Uh, but one question I have also, perhaps mm -hmm. it's very, too simple, but if I'm thinking that we're creating a trust in, in, in Europe or in the United States about this technology, but in, in other parts of this in the world, this is not a topic, perhaps the people are not so sensitive or they have no choice. If these two systems of, of technologies are competing and the others have no limits and we have limits, is this a now, uh, is, where is there the part of the competition if I have the access to nearly all data and on the other hand, I have a very limited access to data for my technology and artificial intelligence. Is there, a, what is the, the competition between these systems? Do we use then in the end artificial technologies from Asia who has not this ethnic trust limits than in Europe? And nobody is using outside Europe the trusted artificial intelligence in other parts of the world? Well, I understand where that concern is coming from. And um, there is, I think there are two aspects to consider here. One is what the public wants and what people want in general, mm. like individuals. And um, I believe there, there is a tendency for people to, well, and the more AI literacy will um, evolve 
the more these concerns uh, we will encounter with, I think. So the more people know about how AI may harm their privacy and other uh, rights, the more they will want securities and assurance that we have a regulatory framework in place that prevents that from happening. And as long as users are rooting for such regulations, I believe that we should not be very much afraid of um, losing competitiveness. The other aspect is that you mentioned that competition between various regulatory regimes. And um, well, that's a whole different story. And I think it's going to boil down to international political power constellations. And I can't predict the outcome of those, but I think the core question that we have to ask ourselves is what freedoms, what core social values we want to protect and in answering that question, what kind of AI systems do we want to allow to function in our societies? And I know it's not a very specific answer, but I think at this point we should perhaps go to the bottom of these core questions and then we can um, address details that come up in trying to implement whatever solution we decide for. I hope that answers your question more or less. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think it was also not a very easy question, but um, yeah, I, I think this will be a future, uh, yeah, it's, it's an ongoing discussion. We will have many turns here. Uh, but we're coming now to the next uh, speaker. This is perhaps more to the regulation in detail more uh, because Professor Renda will come later. He is in another discussion. Sophie Massier Compagnon, issue leader on AI, European Tech Alliance, Senior Public, Public Affairs Manager, Critio. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Horst. Uh, let me share my screen first. That's great. Um, so my name is Sophie Maisy Campanian, uh, and as Ost is saying, I'm representing the European Tech Alliance today as leader on artificial intelligence issues. And uh, apart from my role at the European Tech Alliance, I'm also in charge of government affairs for a company named Critio, which is a French leader in online advertising. So for those of you who do not know the European Tech Alliance, uh, we are an industry body representing uh, EU-based tech businesses. Uh, as you can see on screen, some of the um, major European tech champions, scale-ups and also startups, to name just a few. Um, you can see on the map booking.com, Zalando, Allegro, Spotify, CityScan, Shipstead, TomTom, Adivinta. Uh, so a total of 37 European companies from 19 European countries. I keep insisting on the European because we're very proud of that. Uh, we were all born and developed here in Europe. So we strongly believe Europe is good at tech and that our sector is driving jobs and growth across the continent. Um, as tech businesses mainly relying on low-risk AI applications, um, we also believe that AI is a powerful tool to um, bring tangible benefits to consumers and businesses alike, and that it is a key asset to better understand our customers' needs. Um, and as the European Parliament and the Council are about to reflect on adjusting the regulatory framework uh, to address potential loopholes, uh, for instance, for high-risk AI applications, as uh, Mr. Voss mentioned in his introductory remarks, uh, we believe at the European Tech Alliance it's super important to understand all the existing dynamics and nuances of AI applications today and avoid looping all uh, companies with AI capacities together. So I thought that would be useful to provide a few examples, as you can see on screen, uh, of how uh, AUT members use AI today, including my, my, my own firm, Credio. Um, as you can see, uh, there are some examples popping up on screen. We rely on AI-driven uh, technologies to make everyday decisions uh, faster while improving the customer experience. This low-risk uh, AI applications rank from customer service improvement through chatbots, internal processes automation, fraud detection, uh, which is very important, tell out product recommendations or even instant translation, for instance. Um, so um, to, to, to 
reflect back on what Eline was saying earlier, from far from impacting employment levels, uh, we, we believe these AI applications are actually enabling uh, job creation as EU team members alone employ hundreds of AI scientists across Europe, uh, offering them highly qualified job opportunities with very well paid salaries. In my company, for instance, uh, in our AI lab, which is based in Paris, we employ 30 AI researchers and 60 uh, AI engineers. Uh, and I think we were ranked like top employer in France, like in 2019. So um, yeah, we, we believe AI is good at driving jobs and growth uh, across the continent. And um, given the importance of AI to our day-to-day -day activities, EU team members are obviously monitoring uh, the EU proposed AI Act, uh, which was released by the Commission in April, and which will be discussed by the Parliament and Council officials in the next few weeks. Uh, we've been quite positive about the proposed AI Act so far, because we believe that existing regulatory framework combined with industry best practice and sectoral regulations are fit for purpose for low-risk AI applications, and that regulating high-risk AI is the right way forward. Um, with this in mind, we believe there are four areas, as you can see on screen, that should be prioritized um, in the weeks ahead during the Council and Parliament uh, discussions over the AI Act. And uh, the, the first area for us that needs to be clarified are some key definitions um, and concepts that are um, set out in the AI Act. For instance, for, for businesses like us, uh, we, we don't understand the process to assess whether some AI systems should be considered high risk or low risk. It's still vaguely defined in the Commission's proposal, so we hope the Parliament and the Council will clarify that. And there are also like some vague um, concepts that need to be made explicit uh, to allow us to plan our AI operations um, with legal certainty, for instance, we, we need to understand what the Commission has in mind when they refer to safety components. We need to understand what the Commission has in mind when they refer to bias. Are they referring to an unbalanced data set? Or are they referring to discrimination impacting individuals? Uh, these are very important definitions. And um, we are so quite intrigued by what the uh, commission is calling manipulative, um, exploitative and subliminal techniques in relation to prohibited AI systems. So we would welcome clarity on that, obviously, in the next few months. Um, something that is also very important is that we hope the AI regulation will enter a level playing field between EU players like EU team members and third country developers. Because at the moment, when you look at the AI Act that is being proposed, it's laying down rules for placing AI products onto the EU market, putting these AI products into services and using them. However, the AI Act is not addressing um, something that is very important, which is the training of data, and which is often taking place in third countries at the moment. So we believe that under the current proposal, it will be possible for third country developers like big tech companies, I won't name them, um, to train their AI models uh, in third countries with lower AI regulations, lower privacy standards, lower consumer protection, and this may turn into a competitive advantage for them. Um, something we also hope in the next few months is that, uh, as Michal was uh, highlighting, is that um, the, the future AI Act implementation will be harmonized across Europe. Um, as it currently stands, we note that um, national competent authorities will be able to conduct checks and assessment on an ex post basis. And, uh, for, for businesses, it can also create uncertainty because if you take a company like mine operating in digital advertising, we have three regulators. We have the advertising regulator, we have the privacy watchdog, and we have the telco regulator. So we are a bit unclear about who will be in charge of AI oversight in the future. And as Michal was also saying, we hope that this uh, national competent authorities will benefit from sufficient experts 
in AI to, to conduct the checks and, and, and assessments. Uh, last but not least, we uh, agree with the proposed AI Act that codes of conduct for regulating, sorry, regulating low-risk AI applications are the right way forward. Uh, many of our members are already working on their own codes of conduct, uh, and we are also like developing ethical standards um, to to ensure that uh, our, our data are properly balanced, that we reduce algorithmic biases whenever it's relevant. And we're also trying, of course, to increase fairness to benefit the end user uh, in the end. Um, so we, we stand ready to provide expertise on that. So in conclusion, uh, we support the European Commission's proposal um, for an AI regulation because we believe it's a good balance between supporting AI innovation in Europe and having safeguards in place to ensure high safety standards and public trust. And um, yeah, just to echo what has been said by other speakers, um, we, we, we believe that to support the EU competitiveness, it will be absolutely crucial to have a single set of EU rules on AI rather than a fragmented country by country approach um, as we have today. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for your very brief overview. I see that, that uh, definitions are very important. Only one short question. Do you think uh, through this artificial regulation that we will get now or will get soon, um, startups would like to be in Europe more than, than in other continents because they have a regular framework, they, pay, they can orient it, or is this something what you say, I start my startups better, better in the United States and then going to Europe and adapt this first free of movement and then I, I can adapt my system. What is the better approach? I think the approach that has been taken, that has been proposed by the European Commission is quite balanced so far uh, because they are only proposing like um, regulation on an ex post basis. Uh, so this is not too burdensome for businesses, but as I mentioned and as you uh, echoed it's 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 absolutely crucial that um some definitions are clarified because at the moment it's still a bit too vague for us to plan our operations and be like positive about uh, the future of our ai um development in europe and something so that will be very very important is um to ensure the extraterritoriality of this AI regulation, because we do not want, like in Europe, having to comply with some standards and regulations and uh, see that other third country AI providers are actually training their data sets in countries where um, they are not the same safeguards in place. Because again, that's something I said earlier that would represent uh, unfair competition and um, this is not something that would benefit the EU competitiveness in our mind. Thank you very much. I think there is a good uh, link now to Professor Andrea Renda, Senior Research Fellow and Head of Global Governance, Regulation, Innovation, Digital Economy at CEPS. Yes, we are coming here. We, were, we want to set send, uh, standards here in Europe, but we want to grow also jobs. We want to create trust for the users, but we want to be also interesting for, for startups. Do we go in the right direction with our approach? Please, Andrea. Thank you very much, Horst, and thanks for inviting me uh, to this very interesting um, uh, event. I'd like to, to echo what Olivia said before, and uh, to some extent also what Sophie just said. I mean, uh, the, the idea that regulation kills innovation uh, in, 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 academic, in the academic world is not an idea that has had citizenship uh, you know, entirely. Uh, over the past decades, uh, even before the AI Act. I mean, Olivia said, maybe it doesn't apply to AI. It doesn't apply to many other sectors, actually. And uh, since, uh, I don't know, the work of uh, MIT and Nicholas Ashford, among others, but also Michael Porter over time, the idea is that when it's adequately stringent, well-timed, well-designed, regulation is a blessing for innovation. It actually gives the direction to innovation that we need. And this come, also leads me to uh, try to provoke you a little bit, yeah, and since we're going to go into a, a, a discussion, an interactive discussion later, but the idea that uh, um, um, any AI innovation is uh, welcome, um, is attractive, but indeed, 
when you draft regulation and you want to give some direction to uh, th those uh, businesses that will develop AI in the future, you might want to encourage uh, not really only AI that makes Europe more competitive, but actually AI use cases and applications that help Europe achieve its medium term goals. It's slightly different, meaning if you want to make Europe more competitive in AI, you might want to put, uh, you know, AI enabled uh, innovation robots in factories everywhere. If you try and ask yourself, how is AI going to help me achieve sustainable development goal number eight on full and, and, and it's a sub indicators on full and decent jobs for everybody. Perhaps your approach to how you embed AI in the future organization of work is a little bit different. So the human centricity of AI, the planet centricity of the AI that we want to encourage through um, uh, innovation is at the core of any regulatory intervention, any meaningful regulatory intervention in this field. I've started discussing this with the European Commission on the first day when I was appointed as a member of the high level expert group on AI. I was given a mandate to advise the commission on competitiveness and I replied, well, I care about competitiveness, but I, I care about AI as a means, not as an end. And that is uh, extremely important because when you build a regulatory framework, you have to build it not by regulating the technology itself, but the way in which it's used and it's be it becomes complementary to human beings uh, on the way to achieving uh, goals in the medium to long term. And in this respect, I think there's been a lot of learning inside the, the, um, uh, you know, the process that has led the European Commission to present the AI Act. I, I think it's, uh, it's not an over-regulatory approach at all. I actually think it's relatively minimalistic, depending on how you interpret it. And there is um, uh, a limit to regulatory requirements to what is considered high risk. I totally agree with Sophie that what is high risk uh, has to be clarified uh, over time. But I also would raise an issue here because I think we are facing a sort of a new generation type of regulation here. You cannot embed in the text and ossify in the text of the regulation a definition or a list of those uh, uh, applications and use cases that you want to regulate. Because by the time, uh, you know, Axel Foss and, and his colleagues in the parliament will discuss this, by the time the council will discuss this, by the time an agreement will be found and transposition and implementation will take place, this list will have to be rewritten. So what I'm saying is the AI, AI Act is not extremely prescriptive and precise. And maybe cannot be at this stage. So we're probably facing a much more co-design approach between the, the commission, the parliament and the council, which means the ordinary legislative procedure should probably see gradual certainty and clarity being added to the text. And I think this is more um, meaningful than simply trying to uh, ask the commission to clarify everything like three years before this regulation actually enters into force. Now, actually, this shifts the attention towards how much trust do we embed and build into the uh, governance and the, and the uh, implementation of the, of the regulation phase? The AI board, the potential expert group that will assist it, the uh, national um, uh, oversight functions, so the post-market surveillance, uh, the redefinition of the lists, the reclassification in the risk classification systems of the different uh, types of AI applications. All this has to be built and has to be built in a way that really is trustworthy and obviously the ai act doesn't go a long way there and there's going to be a lot of work uh, uh, to be done in parliament in council but also with the help of all stakeholders over the coming years now what i claim is that the ai act is actually minimalistic in the sense that if you assume at least this is the original intention of the commission that the high risk applications will be uh, a tiny fraction of all the ai that circulates in the market and if you add that within this in this basket of high risk AI application, only those that are uh, already uh, you know embedded in a system that is already subject to the EU product safety legislation will have to undergo a structured third party um, uh, conformity assessment, whereas the others are largely left to uh, in house self assessments. Uh, I don't think this is actually a, a draconian over regulatory intervention. I actually think that this creates a lot of space in a transnational way for creating uh, a standards for conformity assessment that would then adhere to the overall principles and requirements of trustworthy AI, but they don't impose you know, a notified body or a group of third party experts that chip in and try to observe uh, uh, what uh, uh, an AI system should look like in the, uh, in the organizational and governance uh, uh, mitigating measures that it should be accompanied with. So there's a lot to be done that is actually left to 
um, the ability of companies to find their own way to demonstrate conformity. And if anything, I think we will be worried in the next three, four years that what we classify as uh, low risk when interacting with other AI systems might actually generate risks. So the uh, missing bit, which is the, the liability bits that will come later this year is indeed super important because in most cases, the problems and the risks for fundamental rights and safety will be risks that will emerge in the market and they will require an attribution of liability, which will be far from easy. If you, if you look at the examples that we already had, uh, for example, uh, in, the, in connected vehicles, when, uh, um, the Uber uh, managed Volvo car had this accident in Tempe, Arizona a couple of years ago. It took months and months to understand who was actually liable for that. The LiDAR sensor, the camera producer, the operating system producer, the AI developer, the lady that was sitting in the car ready to, to, to grab the wheel. And in the end, the result was not really satisfactory, right? Um, indeed, um, echoing also, again, what Olivia was saying before about um, uh, um, aviation, uh, it's obviously we place a lot of trust in aviation, but we also must recognize that perhaps the lack of trust in aviation that we've had lately was due to AI, because there have been a couple of cases in which we have not well uh, designed the interaction between man and machine, and AI has become basically impossible to overrule, if you think about what happened with the um, Boeing, uh, Boeing 737 MAX 8 uh, accidents, right? So indeed, the fact that uh, we want to codify a number of uh, principles and requirements that have to be followed, especially when the, the corresponding risk is significant, and that we want to give more regulatory certainty as to how these requirements, you know, what these requirements look like, and what could be potential procedures to show adherence to those requirements, I think can only add trust in, uh, in the overall uh, uh, system and perhaps incentivize innovation. Obviously, um, uh, there's always a risk that uh, uh, in, uh, in sort of designing and developing these standards, something goes wrong and then, uh, uh, you know, the language spoken by the future AI Act will not be the same language spoken by the startups or the, or the developers. So Sophie's constructive comments, I think, are extremely important, but also going forward that you, you, you shouldn't be tired of, uh, of uh, proposing solutions because then the next two, three years, this uh, solutions will, uh, will be increasingly important. So um, I think the fact that there might be a, sort of uh, a little bit of a distance between what is in the regulation, what happens in the real world, or the ability and the agility of the future AI board and what happens in the market and the challenges that are faced by developers, these are problems that we can only uh, envisage, anticipate, but we are not sure that we will solve them in due time. So it is a very difficult piece of regulation. But I think at least the European Commission has not made any irreversible mistake in presenting it. And believe me, the risk was there. There was a very high risk because we started this discussion from a resolution of the European Parliament that proposed to give rights and duties to smart autonomous robots. Don't forget that. And uh, we went uh, through this process uh, thinking about uh, a binary risk classification, either high risk or nothing. And uh, at least we came with a, a more nuanced view we uh, started this process by thinking that everything should be heavily regulated through third party uh, conformity assessments. And uh, I think we ended up with a system which is a little bit more flexible than that. So um, in, in closing, uh, three very quick things. Uh, uh, one is uh, indeed that regulation is presented as having an extraterritorial um, uh, impact. It's actually very much GDPR-ish in this respect. And some things might have to be clarified, but indeed, uh, then, Sophie, you would have to choose whether you would want uh, uh, a, the, the regulation to be um, uh, actually dictating where companies might want to decide to train their systems, or whether you just say, no matter where you train it, the moment you come to the European single market, you actually have to demonstrate compliance with those principles and requirements if your system is high risk. And these are two different approaches. Um, I actually tend to prefer the latter, uh, but then uh, let's, let's discuss. On oversight, you're totally right. Uh, I think it's, it's even broader than this. And you know, uh, Sophie, that perfectly, because if you add the Data Governance Act, the Digital Services Act, and um, uh, the Digital Markets Act, and <laughs> we have uh, prospectively a dozen of boards and, and, enforcement, uh, and enforcement bodies, so we actually have to make some sense of that. So I think 2022, if you agree, we can declare oversight year, because at some point we have to fix <laughs> all these different uh, procedures and, uh, and instruments that have been 
sparsely um, and uncoordinatedly included in the different pieces of legislation. And finally, on the transatlantic uh, uh, cooperation, I see a lot of space because there's a lot in the AI Act that is uh, resonating with the discussion in the US. I actually had a couple of recent meetings on this that were quite reassuring in this respect. From the definition of AI uh, to the uh, uh, principles-based approach to AI, so agreement on the principles, to the agreement on the fact that the AI regulatory approach should be risk-based, um, to uh, the uh, potential cooperation on certain risk classifications, including the red lines, to cooperation on sandboxes, so mutual learning, even to um, uh, if those things are somehow uh, converging potentially in the future, um, uh, cooperation on enforcement and oversight, because resources will not be overabundant to continually monitor this market. I see a lot of space in uh, sort of in, in the technical areas of the AI regulation where there can be easy convergence. And since I believe that after the AI Act, the European Commission will actually have to go sectoral because there's a lot of the AI Act that has to be adapted to finance, energy, uh, health, many other sectors, including governance. This would actually reduce the distance that we have with the US where the approach to AI has actually taken more of the sector specific way in the different agencies and the different federal agencies. So I think what seems to be like two extremes uh, and two sort of opposite uh, approaches, if you wish, will actually become much more similar in the coming years. And I would actually welcome uh, much more cooperation in that respect. So sparse thoughts and uh, I'm uh, happy to continue this discussion and uh, give back the floor to Horst. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was a very perfect uh, closing of the debate because we're running out of time. And I think we scratched only the surface of the topic uh, because there's so many to say. I would give very short to Michael Boni a co short comment and then to Axel Foss and not forget we make a picture, group picture after this. But I think we have really scratched only the surface. Michael, short and then Axel, please. Uh, you, you know, uh, I, I, I think that it, it was a very perfect, excellent and inspiring discussion eh? because we have touched not only the problem of regulation, but also implementation. It is important because uh, 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 Sophie and, uh, and Andrea raised the problem of the oversight and raised the problem of institutional capacity at the national level when we are talking about uh, 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 monitoring uh, uh, market surveillance and so on. And uh, 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 the discussion uh, uh, also how to uh, join the perspectives which are uh, coming from DSA, DMA, Data Governance Act and uh, Artificial Intelligence. This is a whole uh, ecosystem for um, artificial intelligence development. So it means that we need to focus not only on regulation, it's crucial, of course, we need to clarify more uh, uh, definitions, and also we need to um, uh, analyze uh, uh, if there are some burdens, some solutions or not, uh, when we are talking about uh, conformation assessment. But also what is important, we need to uh, uh, discuss about something new, uh, which is, uh, uh, Andrea raised it, uh, uh, interactive, uh, interactions between uh, artificial intelligence systems uh, can create the new threats, new incidents, and the new model of liability uh, is important. So uh, on the one hand, we have regulation and we need to uh, make it much more perfect and uh, uh, adjust it to the uh, incoming solutions also from technology point of view. On the other hand, we need to work on institutional uh, capacities uh, uh, for uh, uh, member states institutions and the European institutions and also on the other hand we need to uh, discuss about how to adapt us as users and uh, and uh, the development of artificial intelligence the last point is crucial when we are talking that regulation is important that implementation is important we need also to raise the problem of our uh, AI uh, 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 digital literacy because without our understanding, without our awareness uh, uh, we will uh, lose the, the uh, participation of all of us 
uh, and uh, it will be also the barrier in creating the trust. So, uh, you know, many things to do, but on the other hand, we need to uh, uh, go in the same time with new challenges because uh, this is not a, a finished solution, yes? Uh, we are not uh, regulating artificial intelligence. We uh, want to create the uh, new model of functioning of uh, uh, artificial intelligence changing every day. Thank you very much. And now Axel Foss, please Axel. Oh, thanks a lot. I'm, I think you're looking a little bit nervous because of the timing. Um, that's why I try to be very brief and to, to thank you all for your contributions. And every contribution has an aspect uh, what I would like to see also adapted in the upcoming uh, regulation. So um, if I have something to do with this uh, piece of legislation at the end, so please sit, let's sit us together and also think about how practical this is what we are doing and how um, balanced this might be. I'm still asking myself, of course, if we are talking about trust, that this is of course a very important aspect, but we can override it also. So where is the balance? Even GDPR gives us a feeling of trust in a way, but how we are using these is so much against competition uh, very often. So that is very important to strike this balance. And therefore I would like to invite you also to help us as a legislator also to strike this balance to create everything so this is, um, security, this trust, but also competition. And uh, here for, uh, therefore I'm, I'm very much thanking you also for your contributions. And um, I hope also that we will create an environment for our small and medium sized businesses that they can be creative and going forward and be a good competitor to other regions in the world. And this is what I would have in mind. Thanks a lot to you.